Thank you, Rita. Good evening and welcome to Look North. Our top story tonight. It affects 14 million people in the UK, but it is rarely talked about how a new campaign is tackling the subject of incontinence. We'll ask how common bladder and bowel issues actually are and what can be done to make lives for sufferers better. Also tonight, what next? A £10 million redevelopment of the former Kellingley Social Club is put on hold. It's all about the location, how another new BBC drama could bring more visitors into the Calder Valley, and how the inspiration for a best-selling book about beekeepers in Aleppo is now helping other asylum seekers make honey in Huddersfield. Well, it's been a cold grey week along the coast. This was Scarborough just a few hours ago, but the great news is that sunshine is on its way back. Join me for the very latest forecast. Hello there, thank you for choosing Look North. Our top story for Thursday night, a problem many people suffer but are too embarrassed to talk about. Incontinence is painful, not just physically, but mentally as well. And now there's a campaign to highlight the stigma. It's a condition that causes involuntary bowel or bladder movements and it affects people of all ages. It's more common than you might think. In the UK alone, it's thought around 14 million people suffer from continence problems. And that means... One in five of us struggles with a bowel or bladder issue. But in a recent report from North Yorkshire Health Watch, they found that even though it can have a significant impact on a person's daily life, it's not spoken about enough. Cathy Killick has been hearing from two patients from Yorkshire who want to end the stigma surrounding incontinence problems and let people know that help is out there. Here you are. Do you want to hold Edie? Yeah. There you go. Esther Watson was just 17 when she started to become ill. Among her symptoms, serious bladder problems. She was at university when countless urinary tract infections led to sepsis. And eventually, she had to have her bladder removed and a stoma fitted. It definitely saved my life. Um, I know that if I hadn't have got my stoma, I would have either been killed off by another round of sepsis or an infection, or, a bit blunt, but I probably would have tried to hurt myself. Um, because I was so low mentally. A stoma is a surgically created opening in the abdomen that allows urine or faeces to be collected in a bag worn outside the body. Esther's so thankful for hers, she buys colourful bags to go over it and wears it not with shame, but with pride. It just needs to be more normalised because it, it is just poo and wee. Everyone does it. It's not nothing scary or anything. People should definitely be more open. We weren't. If they do have a problem or notice any changes, they should seek help because there is help out there. It can be a simple fix or it can be a life-saving fix and it can enhance your quality of life. Jackie Butterworth was so struck by people's silence around bowel and bladder problems, she set up a support group for stoma wearers. Hers has transformed her life. Before surgery, she really suffered. At its worst, in flare-up, I was going to the bathroom at least 50 times a day. Couldn't take my... I had, at the time, I've got a 16-year-old, but he was only six at the time. Um, so couldn't take him to school. Had to rely on people to come and pick him up or take him to school for me. Couldn't go to the shop. I had to know where every toilet was. The amount of accidents I had, you know, while I was out and about, and it just... There was no, I didn't have a life. The support group Jackie runs is called Second Chance Ostomy. It meets online or monthly in person in Selby and it focuses on positivity and breaking down the stigma of incontinence. It can, after all, affect anyone, young or old, and is tricky enough to navigate without adding shame or embarrassment to the mix. Cathy Kiddick, BBC Look North. Two difficult stories there of people living with incontinence. Well, earlier I spoke to Craig Derrick from Health Watch North Yorkshire. I asked him whether talking more about bladder or bowel issues was actually enough. More needs to be done. Just from speaking with the public, we found out that it's more to break the taboo, we need to do more than talking. So, for example, we need to ensure that services are more joined up nationally. Um, um, we've also realised that as well that it affects pe more people than just entirely older people. So it affects people of all genders and it affects people of all ages as well. Unfortunately, because of the subject matter, 
until you are living with it and it has changed your life, it is likely to be a, a story that raises an eyebrow, if not an unfortunate smile. As I say, that changes as soon as it becomes your issue to deal with. How would you encourage people watching tonight who think, yeah, that's me, to start that conversation? Yeah, it's definitely a health condition that does, does need more to be done. So from speaking with the public, we found out it's not just about raising awareness, but also ensuring that there's more provisions um, for people and more uh, pads, for example. Um, we've, we found that it's not a one-size-fits-all. So when people have got pads from the NHS, for example, we need to be sure that it's the right um, item for them. We often cover stories on Look North about period poverty. Is there a same cost-of-living implication for people suffering with incontinence, struggling with the cost of pads, for example? Yes, there's definitely an issue with, with continence poverty. We've we found out that people are either going without products or they're not using the right ones, um, purely down to the fact that they can't afford you know, to, to go buy, the, buy their own. So there definitely needs to be improvements in what, what the NHS provisions are. And also, we've lived through a period of austerity where councils have perhaps reduced the number of public toilets that are easily accessible. That must also be a problem. Yeah, it, it, it is a problem indeed. Um, we've, we've found that you know, continence isn't only a, an issue that affects people physically, but also on the mental health as well. So we do, we do need services to sort of improve the way they work you know, collaboratively and make sure that you know, people are either treated with you know, empathy and dignity um, when, when they do require some, some support. And for anyone watching this evening who thinks, yes, th this is my situation, what can they do? Where can they go to get help or what changes can they make to their lifestyle? Yeah, I think the first protocol is obviously speak to the local GP or a health healthcare professional. Um, our website as well at healthwatchnorthyorkshire.co.uk has a section um, on under advice and information. So we've got a continence care, what are my options webpage, which uh, lists all the healthcare um, providers, all the NHS continence services, as well as some really good um, support organisations that can help people, you know, providing advice and, and signposting where, where to go. Craig Derrick from Healthwatch, thank you very much indeed for talking to us on Look North. Thank you. Next tonight, a social club in a former mining community in West Yorkshire is fighting to survive due to a funding crisis. Cullingley Sports and Social Club in Nottingley has a long history in the town, but the costs of keeping the doors open have now hit more than £10 million. Wakefield Council had agreed to spend that amount, but there are fears the club could go into administration. The council has now said it's pausing funding to reassess how best the money can be spent. Corin Wheatley reports from Cullingley. It's been at the centre of Nottingley for nearly 60 years. The social club was a focal point for the mining community before the closure of Kellingley Colliery and housed a boxing gym. But now it's in a sorry state. Maggie Thatcher couldn't shut this club down and we've got people now that are trying to, uh, to shut it down, which is so disappointing. For club steward Paul, it's heartbreaking. We had a chance, we had a chance are bringing somewhat back to this community and it looks like we've lost that chance. The building is in dire need of renovation and has been fenced off for the last few years, sitting, waiting for a decision on its fate. Wakefield Council, which owns the site, proposed spending £10.7 million on an ambitious redevelopment project, including a community hub. But critics think there are better ways to spend the money, so the plans have been paused. When you think what, what communities that have taken away from them, you know, I think this town deserves 40, 50 million pounds spending on it, you know, throughout all community. We're missing so much in Nottingley, you know, even as flower beds are all overgrown. The club, meanwhile, runs from this temporary cabin and they operate a food bank from a shipping container, helping some of the most vulnerable. We do uh, get quite a bit of domestic abuse where other food banks are shut. So on a Friday night, if we get a call, um, we can go feed them on Saturday morning or Sunday morning or whenever. Right, boys, just a little bit of cross control, yeah. And the the football like teams here, continue football to play on the pitches, through, but the big here. question mark yeah, over the future and is and worrying and for everyone. In and out, both feet. Yeah, I've been involved a lot of years and I've seen sort of young lads come along at football and start playing at juniors and making them into good human beings. If we lose this, you know, you're losing like hundreds and hundreds of kids in our futures. 
The council says it's still committed to investing in Nottingley and wants to take another look to see if there's a better way of using the money to serve local people. But it's not clear yet what that alternative would be. The club expects to find out more at a meeting next week. To be thinking that we were going to get so much and to end up with so little is absolutely devastating. Corinne Wheatley, BBC Look North, Nottingley. Thanks, Corinne. Reporting on the future of a true icon. You're watching Thursday's Look North, still to come on tonight's programme. The Steel City Gym turning out talent in the quest to produce the boxing champs of the future. Let's take a look at some other news headlines. A man and a woman from Yorkshire have been found guilty of plotting to destroy 5G mobile phone masts. Leeds Crown Court heard that Christine Grayson from York and Darren Reynolds from Sheffield were strongly opposed to the rollout of the 5G phone network and filmed these potential targets, which they said was enemy infrastructure. Grayson has been found guilty of conspiracy to commit criminal damage and Reynolds has been convicted of eight terror offences in which he celebrated the killing of MPs. They're due to be sentenced on Monday. Staffing shortages at Airedale General Hospital in Keithley could put women and babies at risk. That's according to a Care Quality Commission report. The hospital's services have been downgraded from good to requires improvement by the NHS watchdog. The report found a lack of evidence of some mand mandatory training and no clear system to risk assess and prioritise patients. The hospital trust says the report was disappointing, but it's already making changes to improve. National Highways has warned there might be disruption on the M1 over the coming year as they are more than doubling the number of emergency stops on the motorway in South Yorkshire. New places to stop in emergencies will be created on the M1 between junctions 32 at Thurcroft and 35A at Stocksbridge. It comes after complaints that there's too much of a gap between existing refuges on smart motorways, such as this stretch here. The NHS is urging people in Yorkshire to get their spring COVID vaccinations before the end of the month. Over a quarter of a million people in West Yorkshire are eligible for the jab, but so far only 132,000 people have taken up the offer. The NHS is reminding people that the first and second jabs are still available for the most vulnerable until the 30th of June. The son of a murdered soldier has raised more than £50,000 to help other bereaved forces' children in honour of his father. In May 2013, Royal Fusilier Lee Rigby was murdered on the way to his barracks, leaving behind his two-year-old son, Jack. Now, ten years on, Jack, who lives in Halifax, has walked 26.2 miles through May to raise money for the bereavement charity Scotty's Little Soldiers. Now, a new BBC drama set in the Calder Valley began last night with hopes it could again put the area on the map of places to visit. The Gallows Pole is based on a true story that not many people know of the Yorkshire coiners, a brutal but cunning gang who made and shared forged currency in the 1700s. It's directed by This Is England's Shane Meadows. In a moment, we'll be chatting to a couple of the stars, who are both from Halifax, but first, here's a little snippet from last night's episode. Hey, really good. Need to go. What's up with him? He's been asleep like that for ages. David! David! They look like Come, Come on, on, mate. What is up with him? Is he drunk? No, he's just been like this all day. Are you being serious? We've just run half of Yorkshire. We've got your coins. You need to go. <sighs> Come on! <sighs> <sighs> Dave, what are you doing? I'm just absolutely bloody knocking up that dream of that square. No one cares. You need to go. You've not. Time for this. Oh my god, he's stretching out. Please. Chris, stand up. calm down. I'm it's really crying. Calm. It's what I do. Right, well, you need to go do it. Come on. Oh. That's Gallows Pole. It was on BBC Two last night. Joining me now are Adam Fogarty and Stevie Binns. Welcome, both of you. It's quite dark, isn't it? And I should say, for anyone tempted, it's a little bit un PG, but <laughs> it is a magnificent piece of work. So, how did you both get involved, Stevie, first of all? I answered an open casting on Instagram. So, I saw Shaheen Biggs post. Um, requesting uh, self-tapes from anyone, um, and that's how I applied. And it's quite a different a process, if I understand, Adam. It was very improvisational, working through it. It is, yeah, and Stevie did brilliant, because, like she just said, she answered that 
thing and she'd never done any acting before and we were all called down to Nottingham which is where, near where Shane lives and he likes to do like workshops where you go down and you know they'll pick a handful of actors and there's some big names there as well and you get called up into a room a dark room really with <laughs> cameras and it's great fun you know it's great fun you, and, you but, say that it sounds slightly intimidating it's not as tedious as it sounds well, uh, did, no, yeah. no, but did not. you find that a, a, a slightly nervous process for you um no not really because Shane and, and the rest of the cast were so warm and so welcoming. So as, as soon as you're in that kind of environment, it becomes second nature, it becomes natural. So the improvisation then flows from, from that as well and the relationship between the people that are there. We've got a clip from the programme with both of you acting in it, so mm. let's take a look. If she doesn't want it cleaning, I'll just have an heart attack. No, you don't just you don't just drop dead, Broadbent. You've got to try and keep her talking. Let him get inside. Keep right. her talking. That's why it's called a distraction. Yes. Only have an heart attack in an emergency. At the end. N you know, not just at the end. In an emergency. Right. Don't worry, man. I've got this right. If, if you have an heart attack, which way are you going to fall? Into the doorway. Why? So it keeps it open. Right. <laughs> Great stuff. Uh, you're both from the area. So much drama being made in that, in that part of the world at the moment. Are you thrilled about that? I guess so. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's nice to see, you know, especially the big films that are being made there, you know, it's uh, it's interesting. I don't know why it's happened all of a sudden. You know, the Peace saw was one of the big uh, American... What, what it, Samuel L. Jackson. Samuel L. Jackson. That's right, yes, yeah, the Marvel film, wasn't mm. it? And I put it down to that they'd obviously heard we'd been filming in the area and thought, we'll <laughs> go and have a look and, you know, see if we can get a spot available. How, were you familiar of the Yorkshire Coiners story? Because it is very local to that area around Mytham Royd and Hepton Stall, isn't it? I wasn't. I don't know if I missed school that day, you know, <laughs> but uh, I'd never heard of it before, which I live only half an hour away from there. And... Uh, it's such a fascinating story. I mean, everyone knows the story about Dick Turpin, but this is even better than that. You know, it's nearly brought the country to its knees. Mm. So. Uh, these guys were actually taking gold coins and shaving bits off and yeah. turning them into new coins, yeah. weren't they? And then putting them into circulation in a bit to, I guess, keep a roof over their heads and yeah. make a bit of money. The king was thrilled. I'm sure he was, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and like you say, it was gambling with the country's economy mm. and uh, what they did, while very local, had a national impact, didn't it? Yeah. And it were a community that was struggling, you know, the hard times sort of thing. So uh, it wasn't. It was more through necessity than wanting to become rich or and greed, yeah. or greed, you know. So uh, yeah, very interesting. So a true story, or based on a true story. Have you been bitten uh, by the acting bug? Would you like to get <laughs> back on the screen again? Yes, very much so. I think it's um, it's a really special thing at, at any point in your life to find something that you, you never thought was an option for you and fall in love with it, so... And to see the local area reflected on screen yeah. and be part of telling a story Amazing. not many people know about must be a real privilege. Yeah, it really is. And as a proud Yorkshire woman, you know, it's, it's amazing to see the exposure that the, the area's getting and will get um, and what that'll do for, for the community there now. Adam, without giving anything away or perhaps uh, using some of the colourful language, what can we look forward to in the coming episodes? Well, I think, you know, it's got a bit of everything. It's got a good love story in it, you know. It's got a bit of darkness, dark humour, you know, as you just saw a little bit of it there. Uh, so I think it's got a bit of something that everyone will like to watch. And it's got characters, it's got underdogs. And I think people love to get behind an underdog and likeable underdogs, you know. Likeable underdogs. Adam, Stevie, thank you very thank much you. indeed for coming thank in. Thank you, Tom. wish you all the rest of the best with the series because it does look absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, a groundsman from West Yorkshire has been recognised as an MCC community cricket hero at Lords today. Taj Butt from Great Horton Church Cricket Club in Bradford began playing 40 years ago and he was chosen for his work helping the South Asian community get involved with the game. The campaign was launched in March by MCC President Stephen Fry to celebrate the unsung heroes of the game. We have Taj Butt here today who, who, who works tirelessly in, in Bradford amongst the South Asian community. It's really important to us at the MCC that we celebrate and encourage the kinds of people who put in time to spread cricket am, uh, amongst the young, amongst girls and boys who would otherwise not necessarily get uh, access.
Within the South Asian community, we've been playing cricket for over 60 years. Uh, so that's at least two to three generations we've been playing and, and, and obviously we're very passionate towards the sport and we, all we wanted to do was play cricket. Uh, unfortunately in the early days that wasn't always possible and, and you know, that's why we had to set up our own clubs and, and our, our own league which is why we started the Cardiasm League back in 1980. Congratulations, Taj. Uh, sticking with sport, but into the boxing. The countdown is on to not just one, but two of this summer's biggest shows for one of Sheffield's most respected gyms. Steel City Gym in Darnall could be supplying potential champions at Wembley a week on Saturday, as well as at Sheffield Arena in a month's time. Paul Ogden has been to check their preparations today. My name is Sinead Bostan, I'm 21 years of age and I'm an up and coming prospect signed to Eddie Hearn with five fights, five knockouts. Started with my father really, me and my dad doing the pies, messing around in the back garden and it just started from there. Won my first national title at 13, boxed all over Europe for England in the European Championships etc and I've just been pro for a year. Yes, he did say five fights, five knockouts. Young South Yorkshireman Junaid Bostan is at Sheffield Arena on the 1st of July. On the undercard of the one the whole city will be behind, homeboy Dalton Smith. The headline act that night against Sam Maxwell. Smith looking to add Maxwell's Commonwealth Super Lightweight title to his British. It's going great, you know, I'm picking up tiles. You know, I want to move on to big, bigger things, you know, maybe European and, and pushing on towards world honours and to build a fan base up and the support. You know, that, that's one of the main things a fighter needs, you know, to, to, to move on, to get the big fights. You need that support, you need that backing. Not, not even just Sheffield, the whole of Yorkshire, you know, they, they seem to be getting behind me and, you know, they, they wanted me to do well and, you know, and bring back the goods. I've seen the Leeds crowd shout for you, which is quite an achievement, I think, for a Sheffield lad. Exactly, you know, it's um, you know, it it very rare it happens. And Dalton Smith's stablemate, Sonny Edwards, adopted by the Steel City years ago, has just 10 days to wait until he defends his IBF World Flyweight title against the Chilean Andres Campos at Wembley a week on Saturday. Paul Ogden, BBC Look North, Sheffield. Yeah, our best wishes to them. Now, the stage version of the best-selling book, The Beekeeper of Aleppo, has opened at the Playhouse in Leeds. The story was inspired by a Syrian refugee who set up a beekeeping project in Huddersfield after escaping the civil war in 2013. Riyadh Ulsus says keeping bees are helping refugees to rebuild their lives. Nicola Rees has been to meet the real-life and world expert, Beekeeper of Aleppo. This is the colour of English bees. The drones, they came from their mother. Very black. At home with his beloved black bees, Riyad Al Sous runs the Buzz Project in Huddersfield, helping refugees to feel a sense of community with the help of bees. We are reflecting the behaviour of bees to, ref to, to, to behaviour of refugees, just to keep them always busy, always happy, feeling they are in peaceful life. All this behaviour they will gain from bees, bees' behaviour. Riyadh knows what it's like to be a refugee. He arrived here from Syria in 2013 when his country descended into civil war. He's one of the world's leading experts in bees. Back home, he managed 500 hives. And with the help of some new friends here in Yorkshire, he was able to continue his passion. It is my destiny to get first hive. It was English black bees. The people in Yorkshire are very welcoming, very lovely people and very, like, helpful people. Uh, every place, there is a special smile. Riyadh's story helped inspire the best-selling book, The Beekeeper of Aleppo, and now the book's been adapted for the stage. From the south to the north, city by city, what started off as a little spark lit the entire country on fire. This is our bombed out world of Syria, which has been taken over by nature and left in the sand. Even the furniture ends up embedded in the sand dunes. In the new production at Leeds Playhouse, Joseph Long plays the part of the Syrian beekeeper. How much have you been touched by Riyadh's story? Oh, very much. I mean, it, just meeting him today and just talking about how he had to escape and 
uh, and just trying to identify with that for my character. It's just, <laughs> he's an inspiration. Yeah, we look, a lot, we look like brothers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and this is you. When I watched the, the play yesterday, I remember the last minute when I was standing on my balcony saying uh, goodbye Damascus, goodbye my home. And of course, there's Honey, produced by the Huddersfield Refugees. You can pick up a jar after the show and hear more about the bees that are changing lives. Nicola Rees, BBC Look North, Leeds. That is an extraordinary story. I had no idea it had a local connection. The show is on at the West Yorkshire Playhouse uh, for the next couple of nights as well. Uh, fine weather for beekeeping, would you say? Well, I would think that they probably want a bit more sunshine. I mean, okay. it's been fairly cloudy today, and that's what I can offer Tom. So really? Yes, yeah, so Paul Hudson great promises a lot. Can he deliver, ladies well, and gentlemen? Let's, let's we'll find, find out. What we, but this is for you, Tom. Okay, uh, you'll know this. Lovely. You're from Sheffield, Ringing Low Road, top of Ringing Low Road, that's with the silhouette of Stanage Edge there. With the, uh, I'm sure you know that that's uh, Cumulus Type 1 there on the horizon. I'm just ticking it off on my book now. Thank you very much. And the second picture is, is beautiful as well. I mean, I've selected these because we've not had any sunshine today, but that is the view, I imagine, from Otley looking over towards uh, Ilkley Moor, a fabulous shot that was taken at around about 9 o'clock uh, yesterday evening. Keep the pictures coming in, Twitter, Instagram and on the Weather Watcher website. And if you're fed up of the cloud, which hasn't broken at all today, but spare a thought for anybody along the coast, North York Moors, where it's been a really grey and chilly week, well, help is at hand because it does look as though the cloud is going to widely break up in the next 12 to 18 hours. So uh, this is your headline tomorrow after what could be a cloudy start, but that cloud's not going to hang around. I think we're going to see it turning sunny. Skies like this evolving across the whole of Yorkshire into Derbyshire, Nottinghamshire and along the coast as well. And high pressure remains in charge. As I've said all week, it really is turning into a notable dry spell. Some of us have not had any rain since mid-May and the way it's going, we might get to mid-June without any rain as well because this is going to be sat here all weekend and for the whole of next week too. Right, there's your satellite picture. A lot of cloud, as you can see, but the clues in the North Sea for tomorrow's weather, the cloud is more tenuous, it's heading our way and will eventually break up. So it's a little bit of a disappointing evening. It's dry for the cricket at Headingley, of course, at least it's dry, but it's going to be a cloudy evening. Overnight, that cloud just uh, subtly beginning to break up. Still some cloud left by dawn and we'll see temperatures coming in at 7 or 8 degrees Celsius. Tomorrow's high water times then, a sunnier look Finally, certainly in the afternoon, 3.40, and again, at just short of 4 o'clock. So there will be some cloud around first thing, but it'll be a brighter picture. And look at how the cloud, it all disappears through the morning and certainly into the afternoon. Lots of sunshine, a bit of patchy cloud feeding back into the coast. But all in all, it's a much better prospect, more sunshine. Temperatures reaching 18 or 19 degrees, very close to average, actually, for early June. And Saturday looks a stunner. It looks sunny all day. Grey start on Sunday, sunshine later. And look at that for the whole of next week. That's the forecast, Tom. Did you say tenuous cloud? Tenuous. Tenuous cloud. They're my favourite indie band from the 1990s. Oh, really? Cloud. Uh, Phil Bonner is here at half past ten tonight. And that's as far as we go on Look North, though. So from all your Thursday night team, a very good evening to you.